We live in a culture right now that, and maybe, maybe we've always been hateful, but it's never been so open. It's never been so open. And, and I think it's because of the media and everything else. And hate, what does he mean by hate? Well, I just want to tell you something. Jesus' definition of hate is different than the world's definition of hate. And, uh, and obviously, when I counsel people who don't know the Lord, then it's very important that we introduce them to that better life. So uh, I'm really excited about what I'm teaching today. Uh, you know, do I say that every week? I'm always excited about what I'm teaching because I'm teaching the Word of God. I'm calling today's message, this is Jesus Creed number three, and I'm, and I'm calling this message Tempted to Hate. We just, we live in a culture right now that, and maybe, maybe we've always been hateful. But it's never been so open. It's never been so open. And, and I think it's because of the media and everything else. And, and, I, and I just tell you, I just tell you, if, if, it, if, it, if I didn't love to learn and uh, it wasn't important to me to know what's going on in the world during the political season, I would just turn everything off. You know what I'm saying? Because it is just hate. And, 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 I, and I'll tell you, for the, for the non-believer that hates, that, you know, it doesn't really bother me. For the believer that hates... Now, here's the deal. Some of you may be thinking, no, nobody in this group. I'm talking about the second service right now. Some of you in this group may be thinking, hate? What does he mean by hate? Well, I just want to tell you something. Jesus' definition of hate is different than the world's definition of hate. So today we're talking Jesus' definition of hate. And I promise you that I fit in the same boat that you guys do sometimes in struggling with, with dealing with Jesus' definition of hate. But if you will just hang with me today, I'm going to, as I work through this this week, I, I started thinking about things and, and how this leads to this and how this leads to this. And, and if you want to know where I'm going, I'm going to going to be talking about the Good Samaritan Day, which is in Luke chapter 10, I think. Luke chapter 10. And then I'm going to share a couple of other verses, but, but let, me just, uh, let, me, let me start off with a little bit of review uh, in this Jesus Creed. We know that the Jesus Creed is four words, right? Four words is the Jesus Creed. What is it? Love God and love people. That's the Jesus Creed. And, and the reason we call that the Jesus Creed, because that's the principle that we live by. That's, that's what the principle Jesus lived by, and that's what we live by. And, and Jesus really changed things, because in the Old Testament, they had what was called the Shema. And the Shema was a prayer that, that you start, that Jewish kids learned before they could say Dada. You know, before they say da da, they were, to, and it was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then and then some other verses that were in there, and that was just a part of what they did. So Jesus, when Jesus came along, he took that verse out of Deuteronomy, and then remember we talked about how have you ever thought you'd like a verse from Leviticus? <laughs> well, we have one from Leviticus because Jesus took that teaching from the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, and he added to it. From Leviticus, it says, don't speak of revenge or, hear, or bear grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, so Jesus put those two together from the Old Testament, and he came up with the Jesus Creed. And he said, look, if you will live your life according to these two rules, all the other rules, it just simplifies and it clarifies, doesn't it? It doesn't it to you? It does for me. I mean, golly, there's, there's, there's no situation I can look at and think, now, if I really believed love God and love people, how would I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it affects every single thing you do. There's nothing you do. There's nothing in your thought life. There's nothing you do that isn't affected by understanding love God and love people. Okay, hang with me. Why don't I pray? Because I'm about to get into some... You know, I'm not going to get anybody mad at me, I promise. But I will tell you, if you hate me after this message, then you are disobeying Jesus completely, okay? I'll just tell you that. And uh, bouncers, if y'all will just stand down back there, we'll, we'll take. Father God, we just come to you this morning and we know how much you love us. And we do thank you for this rain. We're so thankful that we're not in the middle of a drought right now. We're thankful that uh, you've given us such beautiful weather and such a mild winter. And, and Lord, I just pray that we, if we don't have anything else to be grateful for today, that we're grateful for that. But, but I know we have something else. Jesus died for us. 
Wow, God, no matter what's going on in our life, that's the most important thing is that Jesus died for us. And I just pray that that be the thing that make us grateful. I pray right now as we're sitting here and we've been dealing with all kinds of crud in our life all week long, everything from busy moms to hurting dads to, to uh, uh, cheated employees, whatever, whatever we got going on, we, we, we know, Lord, that you're here. And I just pray that, that we focus on that right now. This is church. This is a safe place. This is a place for us to be with your love. And we thank you for that. And Lord, I pray for each of us that we take a step closer to you than we were when we came in here today so that we will be more like Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just hang with me for a minute. Hang with me for a minute. Stop and just think about this. First of all, I, I want to give you... I want to talk to you about some, a couple of things that are very important. Jesus had a purpose when he came. And I apologize, I don't have this verse in your notes. But it's John chapter 10, verse 10. And Jesus said this, you ready? He said, the thief, who's the thief? The devil, the enemy, Satan, whatever you want to call him. He, he came to destroy you. Destroy you. That's what he, and, and, and here's what destroying is. You ready? Des destroying doesn't mean hit you with a bus, although I think he would like to do that. But destroying means keeping you disconnected from God. That, that's his whole role. That's John 10, 10. And Jesus is the one saying this. I didn't make that up. So, and then Jesus said, but I have came to give you a full and purposeful life. I came to you for you to have a good life. I'm not talking about a bunch of money. I'm not talking about a beautiful house. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about a life of purpose and fullness and a, a, a sense of, of joy and love and because, because it's a kingdom life. You know what I'm saying? The people out there that are rich and you wish you were them, they, if, if they don't have that kingdom life in them, they don't have what you have. And they wish that they had because they found out the hard way that money can't buy me love. That's a song, isn't it? Uh, was that out of tune? Was that out of tune? Beatles, right? Beatles, yeah. Get Jeb to come in and sing that. He knows all the Beatles songs. Uh, but Jesus wants us to love God and love people to have this rich and satisfying life. That's, that's what he's all about. But why all the hate? Why all the hate? I think if I was to ask you uh, what the opposite of love is, our natural response would be what? Hate, right? Oh, that's easy. No. It's not. That's not the answer. And I really thought about that a lot this week because that was where I was going with everything, that the opposite of love is hate. Man, this is going to be easy. It's so easy to tell people what hate is all about until you look at the definition of what Jesus says. Would you bring me the next slide? Look at that. The opposite of love is not hate. It's what? Apathy. It's not loving. So that means, that means just not caring about somebody is the opposite of love. Now let that sink in for just a minute. Because I know what you were thinking. Dude, I haven't written a hateful thing on Facebook in two weeks. I know what you've been thinking. But, but, but the bottom line is, it, it's apathy. It's not loving. Now, now it's, just like, it, it's just like this. The devil's careful with Christians. He doesn't jump in front of you and go, ha! Go kill somebody. He's not going to do that. He's going to go, why don't you do this? Isn't that cool? He's going to go, why would God not want you to eat that fruit? That is the most awesome fruit. Can you imagine? Surely you must have understood God. That's the way the devil works. Because if the devil jumped in front of us and told us to go kill somebody, we'd go, dude, you're not fooling me. You're the devil. Apathy. That's all he wants. He's got you with apathy. Because see, here's what happens with apathy. When you've got hate, somebody can point that out and you go, so you'll have a point in your life where you're going, dude, I really am hating. That's not good. But apathy? That's, there's nothing wrong with me doing that. There's nothing, and when you have apathy, then, and it, which is the opposite of love, then, then there are things that the world says that are okay that you just decide, well, well that must be okay. See, apathy's way more trickier. Tricker. Trick. 
Did I use a correct English word? Trickier. <laughs> Thank you all for appreciating my ignorance. Uh, we think, we think though that we know love. We love mom. We love grandma. We love triple chocolate cake. Have you seen that thing at Tom Thumb that's like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we, 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 we have this thing about love, but, but we've got to realize is that, that real love, we know what real love is. Love is patient. Love is, it's learned. It's learned. The, the feel good love because you love your mama. I mean, that's that, because you love chocolate cake. That, that's a different kind of love, but, but real love is learned. It's something we have to learn. It's something that, that Jesus modeled for us. And, and guess what else? Hate is learned. Hate is learned. You know, I hear these race arguments all the time. Let me tell you something. A 60-year-old man that lived in an all-white area and all he ever heard was bad things about black people is a completely different background than a 30-year-old young man today who grew up in a society. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's just, and I'm not saying that that's right. What I'm saying is, is, is that's where people have come from. They, they learn that. That's what you learn. There are, there are things that you learn that you learn to hate. Prejudice is a preconceived opinion or feeling, either favorable or unfavorable. Prejudice is preconceived based on what you know, based on what your daddy told you, based on what you saw on TV, based on who you got hurt by, any of those kind of things. It makes your prejudice, makes our relationship with other people, uh, it, it's a preconceived opinion we have about who that person is. Now let me ask you a question. Let me give you a list of sins. Which one of these sins do you think are greater? Stealing, cheating, lying, little white, white lying, or murder? Well, yeah, somebody would love to argue that with you, but I promise you. But, but remember, sin means missing the mark. So little white lie is that too. But, but I'm even going deeper than that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one that's going to mess with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one that's going to make you go back and look over the past three years on your Facebook page and see if you've got to make any changes. Okay? You ready? You ready? Are y'all with me? Have I missed a blank or anything? Have you got Matthew 5.21 next? All right, here we go. Matthew 5.21. Jesus said, You've, you guys have all heard what your ancestors were told. You know, Moses' laws. You must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Everybody goes, yeah, I agree with that completely. I agree with that completely, right? You agree with that? You agree with that? You agree with that? We all want murderers to pay. They got to pay. They got to pay. And then Jesus says, but I say, and I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit just to make it a little bit shorter. If you are angry, you call someone an idiot. Those Democrats. Those Republicans, y'all have seen it. You know, you might have even done it. Like I said, I'm talking about the second service right now. Or curse someone, you are judged the same. Now think back on that. I, again, if you're thinking to love God and love people and how that affects my everyday life, that should always affect the things that you say. He's saying here, look, anger, idiot, curse are all the same judgment as murder. You ever think about that? I mean, do you think about that when you yell at the guy that just cut you off on the road? Or, or uh, do you yell about, do you think about that when you are arguing with your spouse? And I don't know about y'all. I would never call these an idiot. I wouldn't be standing here right now. But, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, do you think about that? I mean, Jesus is saying, dude, you might as well have just killed her. It's just as bad as that. You might have just killed her. Now, you got to realize, Jesus is already making an impact, so people are following him around. That's, that's why when you look at this next question that comes from a religious leader who's trying to nail Jesus, you have to realize they've been hearing Jesus speak. So Jesus has already given his creed at this point. And you can tell there's no other way this man would know how to answer this question. But look at the... Uh, Look at Luke 10, 25. 
One day, an expert in the religious law, that is never a good thing. It's never to, it never feels good to, you know, I used to have this fear of pastors because I just, I guess because I just, man, they're the expert of religious law, you know. But these guys were prideful about being an expert of the religious law. They were so prideful about it, they added to the ones that God made. Oh, that's a good one, God. Let's, let's put some add additions on there. He stood up to test Jesus. Now, I'm just looking at that. And you guys realize, when you study Scripture, there, there's reason that those words are in there that way, that tense and everything. He's not going, uh, Rabbi, can I just ask you a question? Because you're pretty awesome. He's going, and everybody's standing around him. He's probably already talked to his friends, and they're going, watch this. Right after Jesus has talked about the birthday party that's coming up, I'm going to nail him with this question. One day an expert of the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now they're all going, you know, Jesus, they're, they're, they're already concerned about who Jesus is and he's starting this new religion and thousands of people are following him around and all this other kind of stuff. So we're going to go into our leap verses next, okay? We believe at Life Connection Church that faith is a leap. And what's meant by that is, is, is faith comes from hearing the word of God. We, we have to learn to listen, engage with the scripture, apply it to our life, and then we'll produce. So here's the leap verse. The man wanted to justify his actions circle that the man wanted to justify his actions the only people that this man thought were good people were other people at his level just it I mean they didn't they weren't friends with you know they weren't Methodists running around with the Baptists or bowling league with the Catholics or they were God's people. And they were proud to be God's people. He wanted to justify his actions. So he asked, Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. So first of all, I want us to just look, besides 1 Corinthians 13, and you ought to always go to 1 Corinthians 13 when you know, want to know about love. Go uh, look at, let me give you some action. Here's what you got to understand. Love is actionable. If, if you're not, you know, if you're telling your wife you love her and she never sees it in your actions, you are not loving your wife. Or vice versa. Love is inconvenient. It's inconvenient. Love is sacrificial. Love is other-centered. Love is commanded by God. And love is for all, including your enemies. So, they've heard Jesus say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he's going... Okay, who's my neighbor? You know what he's trying to get Jesus to say? He, he's, he's, he's trying to mess with Jesus because as soon as Jesus goes outside of who all their folk are, then, then Jesus is messing up. Jesus is messing up. But he's so wise. And as we go into the story here, you'll see in just a minute. But, but look at Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You have heard what the law says, love your neighbor. Now that seems easy. And hate your enemy. But I say love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Can I just ask you a question? Are there people you just have a hard time loving? Are there people you have a hard time liking? Are there people who, if you had to love them, as, as long as you're apathetic toward them, you kind of feel okay about that? Are there, you think? Are there? I mean, I, I, I want to show you some pictures. I want to show you some pictures. Drug, de drug user. Illegal immigrant. 
mixed race couple. Burn, the burn. I know y'all love them. Redskin fans. Huh? <laughs> Gay couple. The Catholics. I've been in Baptist churches where they just thought Catholics were going to hell. College students, drunk college students, animal house college students, rich, wealthy, successful people, alcoholics. Look at that guy. I had a guy just almost looked exactly like that when I was teaching a class at DBU come to me one day after for coffee and he, he wanted to ask me if I thought people respected him. And he, the reason he did that was because I loved and cared about him enough and that he thought he could come ask me. And I told him, no, the way you look, people don't respect you. He came back to class completely cleaned up the next time. You wouldn't even have known it was the same, same guy, all because I loved him. So, you know, I show you those just, just so you can be thinking, you know, because there are people that we trash or that we feel bad about or we're not feeling comfortable with. And, you know, I could be maybe friends with them or I wouldn't even care if they lived in my neighborhood, but I, I don't know that I could really be loving to them. And, and, and I think that's what we have to think about because God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that all who believe in him, and that's our goal. That's kingdom goals. All. That means everybody. That means everybody we're dealing with all the time. If, you know, and, and I just watch this hate from people that I know are Christians. And, and I'll just tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've started to reply to something and go, no, I don't want to mess up my opportunity to minister to that person. You know? Oh, and here's the last thing on that. Love changes the lives of those who receive it. It really does. If you've got a brother you've been trying to lead the Lord and he just ignores you all the time and, and all that, look, you're never going to nag him into heaven. It ain't going to happen. If, if, if you became a, a Christian or, or, or you married a non-believer and you're a believer, look, first of all, there were probably a whole lot of warnings before you did that. But second of all, you're not going to nag your spouse into heaven or into church for that matter. It has to be that unselfish giving kind of love and you got a boss that you can't stand you got a person at work that doesn't work worth a crud and they make fun of you because you're a Christian whatever the the whole love just changes those things now sometimes they'll spit love right back in your face but the key to real love is consistent let's see you know, Jesus went along all that time just always being persecuted. And, and even as he never cursed anybody, even when they were whipping him and everything else. We, so we've always got that to, to model. So let's look at the action that is love. The action that is love. Number one, always be aware of those in need. Always be aware of those in need. That means you just can't look past the homeless person. You can't just look past the Muslim. You, 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 you know, you, you can't just think that there's a rich person. He can take care of himself. You, you, you've got to always be aware of the need. Jesus was talking to them, and, and he replied when they asked who the neighbor is. He says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest come along. This is one of those religious experts. Religious experts. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by him. Now, I don't know about you, but there are times when... I, I, there are times when I avoid people. Uh, but, dude, it's hard to avoid them when you walk right past them, isn't it? I mean, if you're on the other side of the road, that's one thing. But you're walking over here and you go... I didn't think they had watches back then, but he was looking at his freckle. Oh, God, I'm going to be late. You know? And uh, and then a temple assistant, another religious leader, walked over to him, looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. Now, let me tell you something. You know what I love about riding motorcycles? The sides, when you drive by a barbecue place, you can smell them cooking. Everybody is your brother that has a motorcycle. 
not the moped guys. Nobody even pays attention to the moped guys. But, but when you're riding down the road every time, people will go out of their way to wave at you. If you, I stopped one time to wait on somebody. Three different motorcyclists stopped to ask if I had trouble and I needed help. It's a brotherhood, you know, because we're rebels. <laughs> we're rebels. So we got to be brothers because people hate our guts and they just like our rides. But, but here's the deal. The, and that's the way the church is supposed to be. And, and I've just found over the years that most churches aren't. Especially when people are hurting. And I'm not talking about the guy laying on the side of the street. I think all of us would stop and help the guy laying on the side of the street. But what about the person who's been grieving and is hurting? And, you know, we'll take him a pot lunch and hope he get better. And we're gone. They're going through divorce. You know what I see happen with Christians all the time? When a couple's going through divorce, their Christian friends will either... either Get away from them completely or they'll side up. We had a couple at our church getting a divorce one time. And one of the men in our church walked up to the woman and said, and this is it, Life Connection Loving Church, and said, I just have to tell you I'm on your husband's side. Yes, the bouncers took care of him. He's buried out in the parking lot at Bransford Elementary Schools. But, but that's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to love and, and care and we're supposed to go out of our way and, and to help and, 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 and not let that stuff just kind of be a bother to us that we avoid. Dude, this guy walked over and looked at him. That means he knows for sure he was another Jewish guy, another LCCer, and he just turned around and he, and he walked off. Then, look at verse 33. A despised Samaritan. Now I know what you're thinking. That's a college football team. No, this is the Samaritans were half breeds. They they took the Jewish religion and they and they went out and intermarried with other people. The the Samaritans were so messed up to the Jewish people, and this is what the disciples struggle with with Jesus. When Jesus walked into Samaria, they're going. Oh, Jesus, we don't do that around here. We walk all the way around town. We, it's unclean. This is an unclean person. They weren't allowed to touch this guy. They weren't allowed to drink of him. They weren't allowed to let the guy serve them. They surely weren't going to serve him. And this is, this is the guy. This is a despised Samaritan. By the way, the Samaritans despise the Jewish people too. So for Jesus to be telling this story, so here, what do you, who's a neighbor? Well, this guy came by and he just walked right by. He is your neighbor, right? This guy, he just walked right by. He is your neighbor, right? And then this guy come up. Is this guy your neighbor? Uh-uh, uh-uh. He saw a need and went to help. Number two, take action even when it's inconvenient. Take action, even when it's inconvenient. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with oil and, and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. Pretty amazing, right? Nowadays, you hop them in your car and you take off and dump them at the emergency room. And that's pretty easy, right? I mean, all the emergency rooms will take somebody if you dump them off like that. But this guy took him picked him up, took him on his own donkey. That Guess what that meant? He had to walk. Put him on his donkey, walked him to an inn, and, and then he took more care of him. He doctored him up as best he could there on the side of the road, and then he took him to the inn, and when he got to the inn, he didn't go, hey, look, here's a, here's a guy. I really got to go. I got a, I got a Samaritan football game coming up, and I, I need you to take care of this guy. He didn't do that. He, he, he took him in there, and he, and he took care of him. And then thirdly, and I will tell you, I think most Christians do okay now with number one. I think we do not so okay with number two. It's that inconvenience. It's the inconvenience. Are people willing to be inconvenient? And that's where I think most of us struggle with is, is with the inconvenience part. The, if we can just do it real easy, or if it's somebody that we're crazy about and we love, then, then we'll take care of it. So I think we have a hard time with the second one, but then we, it's like the super saints that finish and do number three. 
Don't bail. Finish what you start. Don't bail. Finish what you start. Uh, I'm doing a series on grief. I'm, uh, I'm doing these grief talks on YouTube, and I, I think I just did number six or something. I'm doing one on Wednesday and Friday. It's probably going to end up being about ten. This week I'm going to do one called uh, People That Actually Hold You Back From Healing Your Grief. I'm going to talk about unethical counselors and things like that. But I see this with people that are grieving all the time. Because when somebody's grieving, everybody... A large portion of people want to go to a funeral, and even some of them will even go to the viewing, and then, then about a hundred of them being, bring food. So you go over to that person's house, and there's like food piled all over, over all the place. And then as they go along, like two weeks later, you know when it's hardest for a grieving person? When everybody leaves. When everybody leaves. Because we just think they ought to be over it. we got to go on with our lives. Now, I know that's hard for everybody because we're not all. But especially people that are in your small group. Or people, and that's another reason why. Let's get y'all in a small group. Because we can't. We can't. Press and I will never be able to keep up with all y'all and make sure everything gets done and all that. But let's get you in a small group. And then, and then if your small group is overwhelmed because you've come down with something that's big and can't handle it or you're going to be hospitalized for a while or you're going to be sick, then they can go to our care team and go, look, we need help with our small group taking care of this person. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's just, that's just the, so, so you look at that and, and, and you have to go, if, if I'm going to do like this, look what he says. The next day he handed the innkeeper his credit card, two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man and if the bill runs higher than it is, I'm going to come back by and I'll pay you later. He finished the job. He finished the job. And then number four, be a neighbor to all. Be a neighbor to all. Jesus says to these guys, Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? The man replied, Now, let me tell you something. This had to be a hard answer. They hate Samaritans. Jesus, couldn't you have told this story with a redskin fan? I can see me maybe helping a redskin fan. But a Samaritan? The man replied, the one who showed mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Look, it ought to be a no-brainer that the people of LCC are going to help each other out. But so much of who I want us to be and we should be as a church is the ability to help people outside. So the cool thing is, is as we grow and new people become believers and they're all excited about God and they bring their friends and as they grow, more and more and more opportunities we get to go out and help more people. That's what we want to do. That's where we want to go. And that's y'all. Y'all are the core of that. You're the ones that make that happen. You're the one that, that, you're the one that, that models that for people to see. To be obedient, who do you need to make your neighbor? Anyway, let's go into our time with God. And uh, I know that was so hard, but I really wanted to get you all thinking along those lines. Leap into that Samaritan story and, and think about it and how that affects you and, and maybe some changes you should make in your life. Let's just go into our time with God. And again, thank you so much for being here on a rainy day. Okay.